I come from a different demographic. Or what was the next one? Psychographic? Completely different demographic, so you're going to have to shift your gears and either wake up or go to sleep for Janet. I am a terrible public speaker, not used to it. I usually speak to people like this. Sit down, shut up, put your seatbelt on, and we'll get going. <laughs> so uh, I'll try to be, I will be deliberate and slow. I don't have any color glossies for you. I do have a couple of things on the grease pencil board, and uh, I'll just kind of start out with that. I hate the disclaimers. People say, oh, I'm bad. Uh, never mind. <clears throat> like to thank Scotty and GNF. AC for letting me come down and invite me. Um, also like to thank as the professional athletes do somebody for letting me live this long with stupid decisions that I've made. Um, I think we all kind of are in there. We can, maybe that's part of the exercise we're doing for you, the stupid decisions. Um, Kind of sounds strange. Here's an airline guy talking to you about um, your field, avalanche awareness and that sort of thing. Uh, that why would why would those be similar? But they really are quite similar in my estimation, at any rate. Comparisons can be drawn across the board, um, uh, save for maybe you guys are saving saving people from killing themselves one or two at a time. And I was trying to save myself from killing them at 200 at a time. Uh, but, but other than those kind of comparisons, there are really some very uh, common commonalities, as we, as we call it. Um, I'll be, uh, I can give you a little bit about my background. As Scotty's told you, I started out in the Marine Corps flying uh, fighters, A6s and A4s back in uh, the 60s. And you can imagine why I, where I was doing that. Uh, did a little aircraft carrier work on the WASP and the Coral Sea and the Lexington. Um, I had a tour in Southeast Asia, came back, was in the uh, training command teaching people how to fly jets. Uh, that wasn't full time, so I had a little bit of time off. And uh, product of my time off is sitting over there. One of the seats, born in 1972. <clears throat> um, and uh, I love Richard Nixon up there on the beginning of this. What an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> I know from personal experience, uh, at any rate. Uh, in the, in the uh, for, for, um, uh, for uh, uh, American Airlines, I started out as a flight engineer. I know you, probably nobody knows what that is. Um, and then I worked over to a co pilot that was on the 727, and then I moved over to the DC 10, which is a, a bigger airplane, wide body, double aisles, three engines. And I was in the right seat there, which is a lovely job. You have all the glory and none of the responsibility, and then you move up to uh, captain. And then you got to start paying attention. Um, kind of like, I suppose, just being a slug out on. Um, avalanche runs throwing bombs out and then they say well you're so good at that we're going to promote you and be in a position of responsibility so at that point you got to get pretty serious about your career and then I moved on to bigger airplanes as I got older and more senior and could command those kind of seats so that's kind of my background um, most of my time in the uh, with the airline majority of my time anyway was uh, flying both domestic and international, but at the end, almost all international. North Atlantic, North Pacific, and South America. Um, so I think I'll start out with the similarities in training. Uh, a number of speakers have spoken to uh, how do we train to be avalanche aware. And uh, again, it might be a stretch for somebody to think about the aviation training and avalanche training being similar, but I think they're very similar. Uh, you know, just when I was trying to put this thing together for Scotty, I, I thought, okay, why, are we, why am I even talking to you guys? And a lot of the things that we do training-wise uh, in uh, the Naval Marine Corps community is uh, you start out being graded on three major things, basic air work, head work, and uh, procedures. 
Um, it isn't just in basic training. You do that all through your whole career. So it, most of the time it's self-evaluating for these three things, basic air work. Oh, well, we gotta hide that first. We're gonna hide those guys. Anyway, uh, basic air work is how, how you fly the airplane. Stick and rudder skills, that kind of thing. Can I just break that? Never mind. <laughs> Uh, and this is how we were graded. You're either average, above average, or below average, or you were outstanding, or you sucked. That's unsatisfactory. <laughs> and every single hop, I mean, of course, if you're flying formation, then you have different formation skills. If you're flying aerobatics, if you're flying basic instruments, you'd have other uh, items that you were graded on. But these three, you were graded on every time, and it carries over into life. I mean, I like to grade my wife when she's driving on <laughs> basic air work procedures and did work. <laughs> I, of course, don't do it, but <laughs> I certainly did it with my kids when they were driving. But um, so, so that's what we do, and then it continues through our whole career. I was kind of thinking that this is what you guys do. You do. Or they do, or you do, uh, <laughs> talk about giving a toss. Ran off the track. But I would think this would be comparable to skiing ability. I mean, probably everybody in this room can, you know, ski pretty well. Pretty damn well. It's a different sport than the people that I'm looking at when I'm up on the hill and I'm a mountain host. You know, we're on the greens and the blues. We don't even see you guys. But skiing ability is always going to be part of what you guys do and you're always trying to get better at it. Your procedures are very similar to what Chris was talking about, either this OODA loop, which is observe, orient, decide, and act. Um, and head work. I mean, you're always making decisions. This is the whole seminar is about. So in that regard, I think the training is kind of similar between aviation and uh, this awareness. Um, I kind of skipped this part of my procedures, but the guts of procedures on the hill might be similar to the guts of procedures for aviation, which is aviate, navigate, and communicate. So they teach you that when you're like a wee baby learning how to fly. Uh, and what that's telling you is in good times and bad times, the first thing you want to do is fly the airplane. Keep your, keep your head, keep the airplane level, don't crash it, that kind of thing. Next thing you want to do is get where you want to go. Oh, and by the way, tertiary would be, let's tell some people about it, or let's communicate with who we're working with, if we're not solo. Um, similarly, you're always doing these things when you're on the hill. I think. Uh, uh, that guy that Chris mentioned, what's his first name, Boyd? John Boyd. John Boyd is like a hero of mine. He, he is the modern day, he's the reason for modern day fighter pilots. Of course, now modern day fighter pilots are antiques also because it's all becoming non piloted and it's all out of sight gunfights and that kind of thing. So it isn't even gunfighting anymore. Um, after you do basic training, um, Probably, I forgot to ask, is there any pilots in the room? I mean, commercial pilots, private pilots, hang glider pilots, nothing? Okay, well, we'll move on to that. But after basic training, you kind of have to stay plugged in with where you're going in your training, and that's what seminars like this are about. And I think it's hard to do because there's not a lot of money around. So an awful lot of the people in this room, I'm guessing, are really self-motivated. Uh, it's come up a couple of times with a couple of the speakers about uh, being good readers and uh, being good debriefers or self-analysis of, of, of their own performances. Um, looking at uh, decisions you made maybe that aren't that great or good decisions. The I got a little confused with the looking forward and the looking back, the foresight hindsight thing. Um, probably because I've just 
spent my career dumbing it down to what I could understand. But uh, I would say uh, after basic training, how do you stay motivated? And most of the time it's this kind of stuff that you're doing here. Um, but you constantly have to be your own policeman. You have to, you have to be um, very self-motivated. Like, for instance, things creep into uh, you're out there on the edge of a cornice, fear, anxiety kind of things, those kind of things creep into How do you combat that? I mean, how do you personally go after that? It's not something you learn in a, in a classroom. I mean, you just have to self, be self-aware and be prepared. Um, the one of the ones that, that's common between, at least for uh, us in the airline business, is complacency. Uh, I've got a little story I'll tell you about complacency in one of my events here shortly. I don't know if you guys ever get complacent. Hopefully you don't. Um, you're out there in harm's way. Uh, complacency just creeps in. It's, it's insidious. It's kind of creeps in. And, oh, shit, this was good yesterday. Why don't I want to go out here today? Um, so that's something you have to be continually aware of. Um, and the other two, we haven't, I haven't heard too many people talking about it in the, in, of the speakers today, is um, two things that kind of enter into everybody's performance on the job are stress and, you know, like I'm under stress because I'm speaking in front of a group, but stress and distractions. Um, you get out there and you're thinking about uh, family and kids and not being, and you're distracted from what you're actually doing, planning, you know, bombs, uh, getting to where it's going to slide or you need to make it slide, <coughs> making sure the side country is protected as well as the inbound stuff. Uh, so that's kind of a self policing deal in the institutionally. Uh, you know, you probably have a certain amount of uh, professional uh, resource that happens for uh, whoever you're working for. Whether or not that's paid for, that's again a problem. In our industry, we uh, th there goes to that supervisory or institutional mentality, and it kind of gets jammed down our throat again because we kill them at 200 at a clip. You only get one, one or two at a clip. So the FAA gets involved, the government gets involved, and we have a whole lot more money than you guys have um, paying us to continue these self-education programs. What we, have, what we have at the airline is called recurrent training. And uh, it's, it's similar to a lot of fields, but in recurrent training, you're jumping through some hoops that you're practicing to come down for... Uh, a second session with the FAA, and that's where you have your you bet your license sessions, and uh, that puts you through your paces within B-17 complicated airplane. Um, the airplanes I flew are also complicated, and you need to know how to behave in every given alternate uh, or emergency <coughs> situation. And so, recurrent training is really a great tool. It really prepares you for being ready for the FAA when they show up. And they can show up in the simulator in a nice, warm, secure, dark building in Fort Worth, Texas. Or they can show up on the line when you're flying from Bozeman to Minneapolis and, uh, hi, I'm from the FAA, I'm here to help you. And he sits on your jump seat. And don't screw up. Uh, there's a little pressure, a little stress there, but not really. Because um, you just do what you're trained to do, and off you go. It's not like the snow's going to slide on us. Of course, you could have an engine failure on takeoff, but... Hey, Ron, how frequently and then how, what kind of duration was that recurrent training? You know, recurrent training changed over my time there. It was every six months when I first started, and that was a change from having it be every year, and they were finding people who would come back a whole year later, and they were flunking their checks. So they required them to come every six months. And the FAA was doing it every year. And in fact, they had one point gone to every year and a half. But the FAA is now checking uh, ATPs, which is air, air transport pilot, which is the left seat, captain seats <coughs> of all commercial airlines, part 125, uh, every nine months. 
and that's our check. In addition, they must, within every year, give you a line check when they show up in Tokyo to fly back to New York, whatever. So that's, and I forgot to say at the beginning, uh, I want you to ask me questions like Scotty just did. I want you to interrupt me because I'll forget if you ask me at the end. So if it occurs to you, put your hand up. I don't care. Uh, other resources that we used in training uh, when we were going through uh, that, that were sort of part of the institution of commercial aviation were, uh, was a thing called ASARS, it's A-S-A-R-S, which is Aviation Safety Reporting System. It's uh, a system that was initiated by NASA but then was continued by all the commercial airlines. And it's a self-reporting system. So it, it can be anything as simple as uh, switching to the wrong frequency and you're taxing along uh, in Detroit and uh, holy shit, you're not talking to anybody. And you're taxing along, there could, you could be an intersecting taxiway, there could be another airplane uh, you know, in your way, um, that kind of, and you say, we, were, we weren't talking to anybody for, you know, fully a mile and a half here taxing around. Or it could be something more important, such as a system that you thought was independent and isolated, and you, you did the procedure and everything was fine, everybody you landed, everything came out lovely, and then you find out afterward that it was connected to three other systems, the brakes, the spoilers, um, something along those lines. Because these airplanes don't just have a single function anymore, it's not like the iron 727 where you had one system and another system with its redundancies, an electrical system with its redundancies. They're all interconnected because there's all these <coughs> chips. What else? Intel makes them, I don't know. They come on the airplane instead of changing a CSD or a constant speed drive on a generator, they come on the airplane and they go, fix captain, go fly. <laughs> you didn't do anything. <laughs> it's frightening. <coughs> Glad I'm retired. <laughs> uh, two of the other resources, or one of the other resources, anyway, that ASAR system is lovely because it, uh, you're re people are reporting things all the time, and there's a monthly report that comes out across the industry. And they're all tattletale people. They've all tattletailed on themselves with the caveat that NASA gives and the FAA condones that you have a once a year amnesty. So you tell a tale on yourself, like I was coming in and I had to go around, you all understand go around, coming in for a landing and you reject the landing, it's called rejected landing, and you just go up, back up around, and like second landing. Uh, because I forgot to put the gear down. <laughs> kind of a biggie. <laughs> <laughs> you probably don't want to submit any other ASARs after that one for that year. But, um, the ASAR system works. ASARs has been um, touted as uh, applicable, applicable in other industries such as the medical industry. But they're very reluctant to, um, to sign on to it. Uh, Jerry made a comment about the medical industry practicing medicine. Uh, you know, the right arm, the, the right shoulder, the left shoulder, um, that kind of thing. Uh, it will spread, I think, as long as you can get the, the corporate culture or the, uh, the industry culture to embrace this thing. It works wonderfully. You've, you read things in these monthly reports that says, oh, shit, I was just there, out on the end of this cornice and it cracked and I didn't know whether to, you know, move back, move across, ski to the island of safety, whatever you guys do, now you got you have a nice system there that uh, spreads the word, so to speak, it's sort of, again, of a, a nice resource. And the last resource that we use in continuing ed is, uh, or the, not the last one, but another one, is a thing called CRM. I think a lot of people have heard of that crew resource management, in that you guys all operate in teams, I think, most of the time. It's unusual to work solo. Um, crew resource management is a uh, tool that, again, started in the, uh, at NASA, I think, spread to the aviation industry, and it's incorporated in our annual training, to the point where when I left the airline, 
it was part of a mandatory FAA check. So you had your FAA check, then you had your crew resource management check. It was a double check. And this was a scenario where Scotty and I are flying a trip, uh, and they say, okay, well, you've passed your FAA check, and so now we've got the second session, and we don't know what's going to happen. So we're sitting next to each other, and they slip a piece of paper up to Scotty, and they say, left hydraulic system failure. And Scotty says, looks like the left hydraulic system has failed. What are we going to do? You run your checklist. You do your normal thing. You fly the airplane as if it's a real flight, and you put it there, and you do your procedures and land the airplane. They'll do another one, and they'll say, they'll hand a piece of paper up, and they'll, they'll hand it to me, and it says, you just died. Mm. <laughs> and I hand it to you and say, you're on your own. <laughs> and they up, and they've done all kinds of different scenarios. So, uh, somebody in first class has a heart attack. We just lost pressurization. We just uh, had an electrical fire, but only in the uh, left side of the, you know, that kind of and they And you work actual emergencies, kind of, I think, like, Avalanche training does what you call scenarios, where you're burying uh, one or multiple beacons and you're having some sort of situation where you have to find them. That's the kind of thing that crew, re crew resource management is. Um, it's, it's a really good uh, tool for what I would call um, continuing ed. Um, Again, informal presentation, interrupt me when you want. I'm going to do these four events. These are sort of like war stories. If you were in the Naval and Marine Corps community in the military, you know that all these stories start with, this is no shit. <laughs> and these are all true events. I'm in, uh, I think I'm in three out of the four. Uh, and I, I, I think I present them in the vein of making decisions under stress, which is what this is supposed to be about. Um, I, again, no color glossies, I just that's all I've got there, so I'll just run through it on, on my little piece here. Um, but if, if there's something you don't understand or you would, or, or something you have a, a question about, please stop me. Um, this one's about complacency a little bit, or mostly. Uh, when you guys go out and do a um, a sweep, you know, the, the thing that's mentioned several times today, well, it was good an hour ago, or it was good yesterday, it's probably good now. Um, and if you are to buy into that, obviously you're starting to slip into the complacency side. Um, for us, it's takeoffs, okay? Uh, you're, you're in a takeoff situation where You've, you're fully loaded, you're ready to go, off you go into the blue yonder, and it's hardly ever is there a rejected takeoff or an aborted takeoff. And the reason is because everything works. Uh, it's a really safe environment. Um, the, the situation will be this. You're at uh, JFK, and you're flying to Tokyo. It's um, night. <coughs> Um, it's uh, an inch and a half of snow on the ground, 11,000 foot runway. You weigh 825,000 pounds, and um, you're clear for takeoff. Well, most everyone briefs that situation uh, with their own standard, with their own form of a standard briefing. So, similar to way maybe when you're going out on a sweep or you're going out to run a uh, route with, uh, for avalanching, you brief ahead of time what you're going to do, and you try to cover as many eventualities as you can in the briefing without your partner going to sleep. <laughs> and uh, that's simply a, a safety situation. Um, we have in the aviation business a thing called critical engine failure speed, which is called V1, velocity 1, which means um, the speed at which flying the airplane, the speed at which stopping the airplane uh, is the right idea or continuing the flight is the right idea. So if you get to too fast a speed and your engine fails, you're, you're not going to be able to stop it on the runway. So you have to keep that speed in mind. I think the 
it, the definition of it is the speed above which an aborted takeoff is not recommended. So you don't want to get in that situation. If, if V1 is 143 knots and you're at 149 and an engine fails, well, tough shit, you're going flying. And uh, these airplanes will take off and land, single engine. That's not a problem, even at 825,000 pounds. But you brief that. And um, it's very important if and when there is an event <coughs> right at V1 that everybody does things in a predictable uh, fashion. Everybody does a standardized behavior. They say and do the same things, whether things go normally or whether they go abnormally. Everything is standardized. That's a kind of a safety precept that's really kept American Airlines pretty, pretty darn safe until I left. <laughs> We've had a certain amount of problems since then. Um, but not because it's nothing to do with me. <laughs> anyway. um, so that's a scenario. And what we typically do, um, and that, I guess that might be an example of uh, crew resource management, giving that briefing. I, I know that's where I developed it, was from these crew resource management classes. A lot of times these crew resource management classes also, and I'm sort of digressing here, I'm not supposed to get off my talking points, but uh, involve the cabin as well. So the flight attendants are involved. And very professional group. That, that group really knows, uh, they are maligned horrendously, as we all know. Um, but they are just, they are the, you know, uh, perfect pros most of the time knowing what, exactly what they're doing. But I developed that little takeoff briefing that said something like this, in that scenario that I just displayed. And this is, again, combating, combating complacency. Without doing this, if you're not on the edge of your seat, if you're not alert, aware, expecting something to break, you're not doing your job. So here's the briefing. It says the weather, I'm gonna, so this is me talking to Scotty, the weather's 300 RVR, which is a runway visual range. I think you guys use RVR. No, you don't use RVR as visibility. Probably use uh, statute miles. Anyway, 300 feet of RVR is pretty stinky viz. Uh, your takeoff alternate would be Boston. Uh, it's going to be, I'm going to take off. My initial heading is 220 degrees. I'm going to climb to 3,000 feet normal acceleration up to 1,000 feet, and then after 600 feet, if we lose an engine, we'll start to accelerate after 600 feet with an engine out. Um, if there's a problem before V1, I'll abort, but you will call the tower, make sure the spoilers deploy, and tell me what speed I aborted at. If there's a problem after V1, I'm gonna fly and talk. You're gonna do the checklist. Max landing weight is 460,000, and the, um, MSA, which is minimum safe altitude, is 2,200 feet because the biggest obstacle is the Empire State Building. Uh, and you want to be 1,500 feet above or 1,000 feet above it. So that's sort of uh, a complacency um, battle or, uh, or a, a how you combat complacency. You just stay on top of it. You stay uh, just being surprised that stuff goes well. Stuff should always break. Um, I could get into lessons learned here, but I think after each of these scenarios, I'm just going to pull the board over and tell you what you can take home with you if you care to. Um, but most of, the, most of what that's about is knowing your procedures, briefing your crew, making sure everybody's on the same page, and making sure nobody's getting complacent. If you have complacency problems in avalanche awareness, you do? Shaking your head yes. Oh, yeah. Wow. I would think everybody would be scared out of their pants. I know I would be. We'd be scared too. But I'm off. a good groomer. Hey, no, <laughs> <000 pounds. laughs> okay, and no questions on that one. That's kind of a but they do have a question. So you were briefing this every time before you took off? Every single time. But I fly a little DC nine or I was flying the seven this is a triple seven example. Every time I would brief it. Um, but so what would without you from getting complacent about it or the guy hearing it? Oh, a lot of people didn't do their takeoff briefing. They'll sit there and say, American, you're clear to take off. 
Scotty's leg and I'm just talking. I'll say, Roger, clear for takeoff. Scotty pulls it out onto the runway and he says, standard briefing runs. That's not briefing. Standard briefing, what does that mean? So it was I mean, we have procedures in the book, and yeah, and they, and they incorporate a lot of these things. Not all of them. But uh, you want to keep everybody on the same page. You want to make sure, okay, now you're uh, eight feet in the air with one engine, and you're just eking it out. And is he sure what I'm going to do? Are you talking? Am I talking? Who's, who's, uh, you know, who's on first? Who's running the checklist? Uh, so that's what we do every single time. So this is basically you taking the ball, I guess, and just saying, well, I'm going to be super proactive about this, and this is super serious and important to me, and this is what I'm holding you next to me responsible for. You got it. Yeah. This is a... Uh, what event is this one? Oh, this one, this one happened to me right here in Montana. Um, <coughs> uh, this is my don't panic... Uh, event, and I think it's all about procedures and checklists. So I'll, I'll, I don't know if I see any glazing over here, but is this uh, this one is uh, uh, 757 going from Chicago to Seattle Labor Day weekend, 1993 or so, and uh, we get over Billings or so on the left engine. Um, 757. Everybody know what that is? Two pod engines, one under each wing, single aisle. Where American configured it was very tight, it's three and three. Uh, we're over Billings, and the left engine caught on fire. Well, it gets your attention right away. Uh, you're at 41,000 feet. Um, the bells and horns and whistles and uh, Mary, Mary's the recording, uh, says uh, left engine failure, left engine fire left engine fire, left engine fire, until you push the button and shut her up. Um, but left engine is on fire. I get it. I get it. Um, so what, the pressure is on at this point. You're saying, let's see. Um, there's Billings, because it was a nice clear night. Um, well, this is what they pay me for. What do I do now? Let's see. Well, I think, you have, I think maybe some of this stuff uh, relates to Okay, it just broke now. What do I do now? Well, your procedures are uh, you run the checklist, get the fire shut, get the fire shut down. So you shut the engine down, you do the fire suppressant. Uh, you, you, at this point, prioritize what you're going to do next. You're running a challenge and response checklist. It does take the decision making out of it when you're running checklists. Um, and that's not necessarily the point. The point is, uh, to get everything done that has to be done as you go down the checklist. But in the meantime, you must combat the obvious stress of, whoa, we only got one engine left. Uh, the distractions of the flight attendant bursting into the cockpit at the same time saying, holy shit, there's, there's fire coming out of the front of the wing, there's fire coming out of the back of the back. The wing's on fire, isn't there gas in there? And you say, yeah, there's fuel in there, and uh, we'll be doing a checklist here, I'll get back to you. So she leaves. <laughs> and then you declare an emergency with the FAA and say, listen, uh, we're at 41,000 feet, but we aren't going to be here long because we're in a descent. Uh, we've only got one engine, and we can't maintain this altitude. We're going to be descending to a habitable altitude, about 15,000 feet. And they say, Roger, you're clear. I understand. You've got an emergency. So uh, at that point, I think I remember... The co-pilot getting a little upset with me not answering his questions because I got all these other people talking to me. So we finished the fire checklist, and then he's got four other checklists to run. Um, also challenge and response, but they're a little let lower in priority because the fire is out, at least the fire light is out. Still flames shooting out of the intake and the exhaust, but the wing isn't on fire, which is always good to know because um, there is fuel in there. <laughs> anyway... So you do your checklists, you do your procedures, um, you put off American Airlines dispatch calling up, say, I'd like to have the airplane in Denver, please. That's where we have maintenance. I said, uh, you're coming through kind of broken. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, and so uh, the way it played out is I had the FAA uh, contact Billings. 
I want Crash Fire and Rescue to meet us. Uh, we're bringing the airplane in um, as soon as we can. Call the flight attendant, have them brief an emergency landing, have the passengers. You probably haven't ever been on a flight while this happened, where you have to practice the tuck, you know, where you're just going to hold me, where you have to <coughs> bend over and kiss your ass goodbye. <laughs> it's a whole, that's a whole shtick that they do, which is good. I mean, it's good to be there. We got back down on the ground and everything went fine. Um, 181 folks, and that turned out to be a good idea. Everything worked well because you don't panic. You stay focused on what your procedures and your checklists are. It scares the hell out of you. Get that out of there. Get the scary thing out. You can't be doing that. Um, and that's one thing that uh, people have always said about helicopter drivers. You know what auto rotation is in helicopters? When an engine fails in a helicopter, uh, a single engine helicopter, let's have this be, an auto rotation is the, the ability the, the, the uh, rotors can continue around and you can dead stick the helicopter into the ground. But what we fixed wing types like to call <coughs> auto rotation is it's an exercise to keep your hands and your feet busy while you plummet to your death. <laughs> <laughs> So it's similarly, you know, procedures and checklists, that's what we're doing. We're doing them over and over and over and over. And yeah, it's not a real cerebral issue. You're not making a whole lot of, you know, touchy-feely decisions here. You're doing your stick, what you're getting paid for. And that works. Um, kind of glazed over a certain amount of the other things I was going to talk about on that. The aviate, navigate, communicate kind of came in there. That was where we learned that back in basic. And here I am, 25 years into my career, and I'm still using it. Um, and that's not a procedure that American Airlines taught. Just you have that in your hip pocket all the time. So uh, again, lessons learned. We'll get that at the end. Anything else? Anybody on engine fire? Engine fire is a biggie. That was a, probably the biggest one in my whole career. That, except for the time I passed out, but I'm not talking about that one today. <laughs> <laughs> Ask Mason. Um, event three, we are pawns. <laughs> this is a Richard Nixon story. <laughs> um, when I was in the Marine Corps, I flew A6s, which is a single engine, or it's a, a twin engine single piloted Grumman airplane and you have a bombardier navigator next to you but a little bit below you and behind you because he's got a whole big radar and avionics unit over there. The airplane was designed and built in the 60s. Um, it was a real uh, ahead of its time airplane. It had a cathode ray tube for, for you to fly by as opposed to the airplanes at the time it had a gyro which was you know kind of like on Sputnik. Um, but this airplane had a, a video tube. Um, he would display uh, bombing and navigation inf information from his bailiwick over here and it would come over and be on my screen in front of me. Then I could fly based on that. Um, that was a neat airplane. And I was in a squadron called VMA 533. Um, I was not involved in this operation. We had uh, 20 pilots in the squadron uh, on the Coral Sea. Um, the typical Marine Corps Navy squadron is 20, 20 pilots, 12 airplanes. Uh, <clears throat> of course, we had 20 bombardier navigators as well. Most of the fighter squadrons are just a single seat, um, F-4, A-4, those airplanes at the time, the Marine Corps airplanes anyway. Um, but this is... Uh, so we sent out, in, a, in an operation in May of 72, um, Operation Linebacker, which was we hadn't been north in a while, and uh, Kissinger and Nixon were sick and tired of being jerked around the Paris peace talks, so they decided it would be a good idea to stop all this Chinese and Russian resupply that entered through Hanai and uh, Haiphong Harbor. Uh, Haiphong is just a little bit off of Hanoi and has this great, huge, natural harbor. And most of the Viet Cong supplies were coming, or a big, goodly portion were coming in through Haiphong Harbor. So uh, our mission was to go up and mine the harbor. 
And uh, so the briefing kind of was a standard briefing. They had been working up to this for uh, weeks. And uh, in uh, May, they said, okay, we're going to pull the trigger on this, and off we go. Um, so our squadron launched 10 airplanes um, out of the 12. Two hangar queens couldn't go. Um, but uh, we, each, we each carried, uh, each airplane carried four Mark 36,000 pound mines. So on the airplane, they have six stations, two on a wing, or five stations, two on each wing, and then center line. Center line, they put a tank on, and then they put four thousand pound bombs, one thousand pound bombs on each of them, and you, off you went. You ingressed up high, and then you dropped it down onto the deck at night, four o'clock in the morning and you're flying 100 feet above the water into Haiphong Harbor. And they say, oh, by the way, on the way out uh, off the ship, they said, uh, our forces, uh, naval and air forces, have not been in this airspace in three and a half years. So you might encounter some flak. Thank you, Richard Nixon. So off we went. And... Um, those 10 airplanes, of those 10, four came back. Six were shot down. Um, four guys were killed. Eight guys were POWs. But they were only POWs for nine months. But it was a really ugly deal. And that's kind of the uh, we are all pawns. That's a supervisory error. And I guess you might see that in avalanche awareness and avalanche practice. You probably have some misdirected guidance from on high, not all the time, obviously, but the exception might be that. Um, just throw that one out. It's kind of a fun uh, one to look back on after 40 years. Um, my mantra, and I think a lot of people who are in the military more currently, might be, yes, follow orders, but think for yourself. <coughs> And I think Chris touched on some of the attention to detail things that uh, probably apply to avalanche work. Okay, and the last one, I know I'm probably running over. No, you're fine. I'm good. Last one is a pay attention one. Less is more. Uh, here's the same flight. Scotty and I took off from, uh, doesn't matter, New York. Fourteen and a half hours later, we're in Tokyo. We're on short final. We're at 900 feet. We're descending. The checklist is complete. Everybody's happy. You're looking at the runway. It's clear. It's uh, at Narita. The airport for Tokyo is uh, Tokyo Bay goes like this, and Narita is just sort of on the northeast side of the of the uh, of Tokyo Bay. And it's a beautiful blue sky day. Everything's looking good. You're on final and. <coughs> An amber light comes on, followed by a big red light, followed by the horns and the voices and Mary and everybody. And it's immediately obvious that the right engine is now in thrust reverse, which is a big deal. It's a huge deal. It'll kill you. But pay attention. Less is more. All you do is reach over and shut down the right engine. You're not even at 700 feet. Now you're at single engine. You add a little power and you're going to make a single engine landing. And everything's all set. There you are. You could even go around if you needed to. But you know your procedures. You know that's what you're supposed to do. If you don't know that, the airplane will roll on its back about 400 feet. So you need to shut the engine down. And this is one of those situations, I think I heard it twice by other speakers. Uh, this will never happen to me. But in case it does, and that's one of those deals where less is more. It's, it's one of the seven immediate action emergencies that we had on the 777. You do not consult a checklist. There's seven serious ones that you do respond to by you know, immediate action memory items. Um, so that was a good one. Uh, uh, that didn't happen to me. That was the one I was not involved in. Um, but I think I, th I think what less is, I, I, somebody said less is more, uh, and I'm not sure quite how it applied, but I, as I was listening to the speaker, I wrote it down and renamed my pay attention event to less is more. It's just a simple and easy fix 
for something that could go terribly, terribly wrong, and boom, you did it, you're done. Um, I, do, I did a little synopsis over here, if I can even make this thing work again. As uh, maybe takeaways, if you want to do this, this is sort of synopsis of all the events I did, I mentioned. Um, this one is, uh, be surprised if everything goes right. Uh, how many people have been out there um, and everything goes right, you know, but you should be surprised. Uh, I've mentioned stay focused several times, don't get distracted. Um, prior to rise has something to do with communicating too. Um, Delegate is misspelled. Uh, I don't know if you guys, uh, when you go out in, in teams to do avalanche stuff, whether you have a chain of command or whether you just work as partners. Um, obviously, I came from a military background, and that was one of the things that we always, uh, and, and, and actually uh, airline cockpits are run that way as well captain's in charge and it's his decision. He's the one that's responsible for the whole thing. Um, and then of course the other one is the stress and distraction. Just try to just eliminate those. It's not always possible. But it seems like if you are getting some of those things coming into your into your operation, getting distracted, getting a little too much stress, if you don't deal with them right away, they're going to get worse. So that's kind of all my stuff. Let's got any questions? Anybody? Thank you.